Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening for the second of four conversations organized by faculty teaching in the City College of New York's Graduate Landscape Architecture Program. The emphasis for this project really began several years ago when Erica Svensson and Lindsay Campbell, research social scientists at USDA Forest Services, New York City Urban Field Station, worked with me on developing our ecology curriculum into a team taught exploration of urban systems interactive with human communities, non-human biota, and all of the intertwined phenomena we, we generalize as environment. As they continued on to instruct in the MLA program, joined by Andrea Parker, Executive Director of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, we had conversations about what we were doing, combining geography, anthropology, human ecology, biology, history, and community engagement under our umbrella term of ecology. And we realized it was a response to our students who cope with climate anxiety and economic stress as they look for a foothold from which to launch new approaches and ideas for changing the complex world that they will inherit. The grounding they seek must span politics and ecology, social and biological, so they can generate transdisciplinary conversation across multiple scientific disciplines, design practitioners, and a diverse public. No ecology textbook offers a rubric for this. So we've chosen to open a conversation about what we designers, planners, researchers, and humans need to know and how to teach it. In our first conversation last week, four speakers from a range of disciplines reflected on a zombie idea they've contested through design, planning, or projected research and analysis. Andrea Johnson countered the dominance of centralized planning by offering thoughts on initiatives already in the works to disaggregate the national electrical grid. Amy Lerner contested the exclusionary thinking behind clearing plants determined to be invasive, the clear space for native plants, and connected that mindset and the rhetoric to slum clearance with her research projects in Mexico. Sierra Bainbridge argued that ecology and culture are not mutually exclusive in a presentation of a memorial landscape her office designed. And Lindsay Campbell discussed countering the idea of ecosystem services with social infrastructure that built Hair in her presentation of StuMap and their ex exhibition at the Queen's Museum. Discussion ranged from how to challenge dichotomous value systems to questions about the locus of agency in determining urban futures. Who has the power and why? Tonight's speakers will present their own zombie ideas and we look forward to branching this discussion out into new directions and adding layers of nuance to ideas already in the air. I want to welcome and thank the speakers participating in tonight's conversation. You can find all of their bios online, so we will not fill time here by recounting them. But I want to offer a special thanks to Thaisa Wei for moderating the first discussion and carrying over her incisive questions into our second so that we can connect some of the common threads across our conversations. And finally, welcome to everyone logged on. Please be aware that we are recording this, so don't say anything or open your camera if you don't want to be seen. I have put the link for the recording of last week's conversation in the chat for anyone who missed it. Welcome everybody and Thaisa. Thank you, Denise. And it's, it's really a pleasure. Last week's conversation, I think, inspiring and intriguing, but really um, promulgated a series of discussions that I certainly have been having with my colleagues of the role of risk and challenging the structures in place. And one of the insights I think that I drew out of last week was how we go about change and what it means to actually change and challenge a system or a structure. And that perhaps at this moment in 2020, there hasn't been a stronger call for really taking much bolder approaches to making change. That it may we may be past the time of sort of small tweaks or gently, um, but may need to actually pull, as somebody said, pull the legs off of a table, or as another person said when they were asking about how to make sure they had a seat at the table and um, a colleague turned to them and said, well, maybe it's actually that you don't need to, there doesn't need to be a table. Um, I think of it in terms of feminist histories and, and early historians who talked about adding women and stirring, sort of somehow we could, we could just add a few women to the history and, and it would do, of course, we know that that's not at all what it takes. We actually have to change the very structure with which we tell narratives and with which we practice. So we have to reinvent the way we come together 
not from a square table to a round table to overuse that metaphor, um, but really rethink it. And so I'm delighted tonight to have four speakers who are last week suggesting structures and paradigms and ways of looking at design practice. And I really do mean design practice in a, in a broad spectrum. About how by changing, challenging, maybe deconstructing, maybe destroying um, that paradigm and replacing it with something else and maybe something we know what that looks like. So we don't necessarily know exactly where we're going might be some of the most important work that designers can do today, particularly in landscape architecture, facing issues of racial justice, climate change, the pandemic, the economy, um, all, all of the issues of face this that I would certainly argue are all grounded in place. Um, we inhabit the places we work, the places we make community. So the um, format of is gonna be, we have four speakers, they're gonna talk for 10 minutes politely but graciously end them at 10 minutes. So um, I, I apologize ahead of time if you hear me just into someone's talk. Um, and then we're, I'm gonna ask them a few questions and then I am going to turn and look to the questions that you've put in the chat um, to engage them in those questions. I will ask everyone, um, as I learned last week, um, while I love long questions, they're hard for me to read to myself and then repeat. I'd ask that you ask short to the point questions. Um, and, and that way I can make sure I get to your questions. I'm also, for those who are here again this week, I also copied down some questions from last week that I didn't get to. And I may ask these folks some of the same questions because there were some very good ones um, that came up. Um, so to the person who just asked, did I miss something in, important in the chat? Not yet, but stay tuned. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn to Eric. Erica Svensson, who is a social scientist with the US Forest Service Northern Research Station. So Erica, why don't you grab the screen and go for it? Okay. Can you all see my screen? Perfect. Okay. Want to go back one, having a little trouble advancing. Um, huh. um, sorry, so much for your 10 minutes, Thaisa. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, um, There's usually a button in the bottom left that you can go back on. Yeah, I am. I did not want this to happen today, but I'm going to go back again. Or take a, oh, there you go. Okay. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All set? Yes, except we're seeing your presenter view. So you may want to slideshow and then we'll just see the slide you're working on. I don't know why that does that. It does not advance. Okay, it does advance. Okay, all right, we're all set. Sorry, you folks. Um, so nice to be with you. I'm Erica Svensson. Um, title of my 10 minute um, reflection is Beyond the Biosphere to the Forest Within From Techno Fix to Social Meaning. The zombie idea that I'd, I'd like to call out this evening is an overdependence upon a technocratic design fix in pursuit of the sustainable city. Green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, the millions and billions of trees. Of course, I'm not arguing against these physical design approaches, but they seem to take over and become the sole object of our attention. I guess because we're human. We like stuff and things, what we can point to and see. It's harder to engage, but no less critical to our work is social meaning. Sociologist Eric Kleinenberg has recently popularized this the term social infrastructure, the physical places and organizations that shape the way people interact with each other in everyday life. But how do we see or find it in places where we do not expect it to be? Can we identify and nurture these places, people and practices that create social meaning? Especially when the forces that give rise to social infrastructure are not fixed, like physical infrastructure. In 
what if when we find these spaces of social meaning, we planted our trees there instead of in street tree pits and parks? What kind of ecological city would that be? I've been chasing this idea for a long time, nearly 30 years ago when I was in my early 20s and had just received my degree in forestry, I became part of a national multi-year pilot project called Revitalizing Baltimore. I was given the title of Neighborhood Stewardship Coordinator and $250,000 with which to plant street trees in Southwest Baltimore and to do community forestry. There I was told I would find historic row houses, grand public squares and monuments and woodland areas along the Gwynn's Falls streams. Others would describe my neighborhood as notoriously filled with open air drug dealing, violent crime, shuttered businesses, housing stock on the verge of collapse and more than a few trash filled vacant lots. Neither of these descriptions set well with me perhaps because they focus on what is visible, not what's on the inside. I chose instead to make up my own mind and lean heavily on the words of my mentor, Bill Burt, who told us that understanding comes from as much of a feeling, a sound, a fragmented sunset as from the abstract equation of a scientist, engineer, or architect. My first community forestry project was in the neighborhood of Franklin Square on the corner of Mount and Fayette. This was basically the same corner where filmmaker and writer David Simon drew much of his inspiration and characters for his critically acclaimed and award-winning dramatic television series, The Corner. There I was on the corner every day on a vacant lot where an abandoned row house had just collapsed and where residents were eager to plant a garden with trees and flowers in memory of two people who had been killed. Over time, as I worked in that neighborhood, I found that I had a different story to tell than David Simon, probably because as a community forester, we were searching for something entirely different. I quote my colleague James Giler's reflection on working in Franklin Square in Greenmount West in 1992. The community forester is a bit of a weaver that spins all of the components of natural resource systems into this idea of community, mm -hmm. making the urban ecosystem a place where people want to live. And as time went on in my work, I would come to realize that nothing could better signify the power of place and community and a woman sweeping the steps of an abandoned row house. That's how I met Miss Shirley Boyd on the doorstep of a vacant house. She was tidying things up. Miss Shirley was tending what, other, what others had abandoned. And following her lead, we went on to help her create many gardens along the side yards and back alleys of her community. And in this community, I found that nothing could be more powerful than a parent whose grief for a murdered child turned toward unconditional love for all the neighborhood children and their well-being. This is how I met Miss Ella Thompson in the midst of her advocacy work and her grief. And how our version of community forestry that summer became an after-school program and summer camp for kids in the neighborhood to keep them safe and focused on living things. And I watched as a group of men stepped off their front porches and set aside their own life's regrets so that young people coming home, coming up, might have something better to do. And that's how I met John, Howard, and Mr. Barnes as they threw everything they had into mentoring local kids and planting trees and turning vacant lots into safe spaces, which helped to significantly reduce the flow of drug activity in the corner of their neighborhood. Over time, these everyday acts of visually transient care and connection became sacred to many of us. We did not plant our trees in perfect rows or street tree pits or neighborhood squares. We rarely asked permission outside of the residents on any given block. Instead, we defiantly planted in places of social meaning. We built trust by making clear our own vulnerabilities and pooled our strength together. We became believers in nature as our sacred totem, as it helped us regain a sense of control to create and to leave a legacy. And oh, how important it is for everyday people to leave a legacy. Still, David Simon didn't have it all wrong. Life on the streets was tough. And if you were one of the few people in the neighborhood trying to green it up, well, you needed allies, you needed friends. 
So we reached out to other community organizers in justice, housing, social services to broaden our own small network of green responders in the city. And on Thursday evenings, this funky bunch met in a long boarded up yet historic branch of the Enoch Pratt Library. The time, this time we got permission, dusted off the tables and made a few repairs. And there each week we plotted our community forestry projects across the city. We invited others in from government and from organizations like the Neighborhood Design Trust and the Community Law Center, and even the occasional academic to speak with us. We knew we couldn't do it alone. We developed a shared competency. We could speak fluently in our own way about the social ecology of Baltimore. And we gave time to each other on the weekends to help greening, to help with each other's greening projects. And we proudly called ourselves the Tree Tribe to mark our shared culture and understanding. Of course, that was a few decades ago now. And photographer Steffi Graham and I, I did return to our old stomping grounds over the years. Some of the tribe had moved on. Some, more often than not, had sadly died of the conditions that commonly plague vulnerable communities of color. Still, we patched together stories like it was our own family scrapbook. We went to some extremes, and not all stories ended well. But some turned out better than our wildest dreams. And all in all, it was an incredible thing to be there when people thought back in time, reflecting on themselves and their city. Most conversations would start the same way. Gee, my gosh, I don't rem that was a long time ago. And then the next thing you'd know, we'd be sitting there for hours, ending always with a promise to meet again. A woman who was now pretty high up in city government met me carrying one of Steffi's photos framed and tucked under her arm. She told me that she kept that photograph hung on her wall and on the wall of every office she's ever held over the years and inspires her still. We found another man whose family actually adopted one of the kids from the neighborhood and a few years later took in one of the older ladies that he'd worked with, worked with us on a large vegetable garden in Greenmount West. Others wrote us back from faraway places, one man from jail. Only traces of the garden and trees we planted long ago remain. What is left is the forest within. Our public lands, wherever they may be, whatever size they may be, are co-created landscapes born out of the rights and responsibilities that we give ourselves. And if we speak only of the urban forest for its efficiency, for its biophysical performance and design, then we may always be in search of someone or some institution to sustain it. But if we speak of the urban forest as a sacred landscape, a place of social meaning, we may speak it into eternal existence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if I could re remind everybody to please mute yourself, um, that would be great and that we won't hear the feedback. Um, next, we're going to have Kate Orff, who is a professor at Columbia and director of the Urban Design Program, running an office. Um, she's a registered landscape architect and founder of SCAPE, an award-winning professional practice based in Lower Manhattan. Kate, you're on. All right, I've unmuted myself and I am now sharing screen. So far, so good. Um, thank you so much. I love being part of this all-star women panel. Really excited to hear to all these different perspectives. My talk, my hopefully eight minute talk will be, is called SDDD, CD, and CA. I imagine for all of you um, in practice that these are quite familiar uh, terms, schematic design, design development, construction documents, and construction administration. Um, we are trained to organize our workflows into these very narrow categories of professional services in preparation for competitive bid and construction by others, when what we really need to be doing is loving the landscape and proliferating awareness, care, and stewardship. We need phases of our projects and of our work that really reflect the social life of landscape. These need to be rewritten and placed into frameworks. Um, and we need to be thinking about movement building and collective gardening. So these are my proposed new phases. And I propose to kill the zombie idea of these uh, phases that somehow dominate the process of the landscape architect. 
And um, I'll just talk about these um, uh, in my remaining time. So schematic design, loving the landscape. Um, here you can see in a checklist below what is traditionally desired or necessary for a schematic design set. Verifying the survey, addressing design requirements for access, reviewing landscaping with local code officials, et cetera, et cetera. But at SCAPE, what we do um, in this phase is we fall in love with every landscape that we encounter and that we work in. This is just one example of a site in Stapleton off of Staten Island where um, I, these um, incredible uh, goldenrod and this man fishing uh, basically uh, took our breath away. Um, and so the, our entire design process was um, front ended by uh, falling in love and, and having these moments with. Um, so as much as this is like a credibly typical you know, DPR park with all of the requirements that that needs. Um, we managed to find ways, like you can see here on the slide on the right, for that moment to continue and fast and be fostered and carry forward in the project. We're doing a 100 linear mile um, uh, uh, linear park or and and trail in Atlanta, Georgia, called the Chattahoochee Riverlands. And uh, for that project, we also spent a lot of time literally on the river, one, one, moving through the river, paddling on what we're calling sort of river rambles uh, with people that live there, um, walking with people through this massive landscape, um, discovering what it means and being with people who, with different ages, different abilities. We had a river ramble on accessibility and on local ecology. And in this way, really fell in love with this, um, you know, sort of um, hidden treasure of the Chattahoochee and uh, this major river that really grounds this entire bioregion. And so, you know, this is just to give you a sense of the scale of this project. That's Atlanta in the background. So that's a lot of landscape to fall in love with. But again, all of our projects start with this complete um, uh, collapse and uh, love for uh, the landscape. Okay, on to design development. All right, so with this concept, I really feel like uh, what we try to do is visualize the invisible. So, so much in a landscape is hidden and unseen, and it is our job really to kind of pull these things out, reveal them and stitch them together and kind of literally look beyond the, you know, the edges of the site. So, for this book for Petrochemical America with Richard Mizrak, the photographer, I really tried to do that in a very um, uh, clear way. This is the sort of, um, sort of sacrificial zone once known as Cancer Alley in between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And through a series of drawings and working with Richard's photographs began to craft this sort of um, looped and living uh, table of contents, if you will, and began to visualize all of these unseen uh, presence of oil in the landscape and kind of rather than move sequentially in a linear way, A, B, C, D, really used scale as a way to kind of unpack um, what was hidden uh, within each of these photographs and begin to tell stories of, of, of communities that, um, have, that and, and, and sort of bring these to the public consciousness. As you can see here in this, this story of this just one community of many that we at Morrisonville that we researched and trained based. Keeping going. So for construction documents, yes, this is the part of the project where you really um, define the, um, the, the physical extents, the materials, um, and uh, begin to finalize all very fine grained details. For this phase, I would like to propose foster ecosystems as infrastructure. And for this and in all of our work, we're looking at how to reframe um, all ecosystems um, and, and rethink about them as um, our living infrastructure to host people, to host um, robust uh, and biodiverse uh, uh, environments, and to think beyond the scale of the human to the animals and uh, flora and fauna that uh, we cohabitat the planet with. So this is just one example of SCAPE's project um, called the shallows, which uh, investigated these shallow water landscapes and coastal landscapes as ecological infrastructure. And on the left is just a quick synopsis of all the um, iterative modeling runs that we did. With Living Breakwaters, which is a large project in Raritan Bay, we developed design parameters. We actually did construction documents. I suppose I had to throw this in here because somehow you have to do 
both in this world. Um, but then the whole point of this was to design this project as a pilot for other projects to be able to move forward. So the data collection that's designed enables this project to be a pilot and an example for many, many more ecological infrastructure projects in the future. And finally, construction administration, which is usually arguing on the site, screaming at a contractor, saying you substituted my plant with the wrong plant, and why is this mulch not the right specification and the soil sample wasn't provided on time, right? This is our CA process. So I would like to put forward that we must nurture and create participatory processes and completely explode this idea. And can we not bring together physical design, like you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, in this case, an Army Corps of Engineers, uh, uh, marsh rebuilding um, process with what's happening on the right hand side of the screen, which is people in the landscape, in this case, American Littoral Society volunteers and students. Can we just collapse this and get rid of that pesky CA phase? So this is one of the things that we tried to do from the outset at Living Breakwaters, pulling these kind of three phases of risk reduction, bringing educators to the shore and rebuilding offshore or shoreline ecologies. Um, it creates, it's a, a project that requires a lot of this participatory design uh, thinking and uh, has brought us through, um, you know, years now. Um, we're at the eighth anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, almost eight years of, of this kind of work of building and rebuilding constituencies, ideas, knowledge, and love. And in this way, um, we can really begin to scale up our efforts across the landscape and not be caught, um, you know, dealing with the lowest bidder, which happens a lot. So I, this is my last slide. Um, I wrote about these ideas in a book called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis in a chapter titled Mending the Landscape. So this is the zombie idea that I would like to kill. I feel like landscape architects hold on to what little power they have by putting their work into these tiny boxes and to these phases, which comply with uh, the, 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 the way that business as usual is run. And I would like to put that aside and focus on all we can save. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, Andrea Parker is a lecturer in ecology in the graduate program in landscape architecture at CCNY and executive director of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. Andrea, all yours. Thank you, um, and great to see everyone here tonight. I see lots of friendly City College faces as well as GCC faces, so it's great to have everyone together. Um, we are going to talk about poop now, and um, I want to I want to just forefront this by and you know folks that have taken my class will certainly have heard me talk about poop. Everyone's heard me talk about poop quite a bit. Um, we are as as you guys know, we're in the midst of this sort of international paradigm shift from the sanitary city to the sustainable city. Um, this shift has resulted in a range of forward thinking municipal policies and built projects. But in order to fully embrace this shift, we cannot just rely on top-down planning and design driven by siloed agencies and compelled by regulation. I'm in no way saying that this top-down approach isn't a critical part of the equation, because it is, but it must be paired with bottom-up education and community organizing around infrastructure. And in order to do or that organizing, we must call the problem by its name and we need to actually talk about poop. Um, so probably many folks here know that we have a combined sewer system in New York City, as in many um, uh, cities that were built around the same time where both stormwater and sewage go into the same pipe. When that pipe gets too full, it overflows into adjacent water bodies. Um, in New York City, we have about 27 billion gallons of this combined sewage overflow overflowing into our water bodies every year. And as you can see from this map, this disgusting problem is even more acute. Red means acute here. Um, on the sort of smaller water bodies like the Gowanus Canal, Newtown Creek, uh, Bronx River. Um, and so the, the photo at the beginning of, this, of the talk was actually from the Gowanus Canal during a punami. Annually, about 363 million gallons of combined sewage overflow overflow into the Gowanus. So water bodies like this are in direct violation of the Clean Water Act. Why after almost 50 years after the Clean Water Act was passed, why haven't we seen this fixed? 
And I believe it has quite a bit to do with the fact that the strategy has been primarily top down, relying on bureaucratic actors to enforce the federal legislation. Um, this is a timeline of the process in New York City. So the city is responsible for this ongoing combined sewage overflow. The state finally in 2005 got up the nerve and the political will to actually enforce the law. Um, however, the city will not actually complete a lot of the work that's required to get the water bodies into compliance by 2035 for some water bodies. For other water bodies, they have not even given a date. Um, sorry. So this actually, this is a closer look at the long-term control plans um, for each of these water bodies. And as you can see, there are some Westchester Creeks getting no new infrastructure. Um, Bronx River is redirecting the CSO to the East River. These aren't real solutions. <laughs> They're just ways to comply with the regulation. Additionally, a huge part of this plan and you know something that is extraordinarily exciting when we think about a sustainable city is that green infrastructure was supposed to be a huge part of the solution. So the idea was that 10% of impervious surfaces citywide would be turned into green infrastructure. Um, Whoops. How did I do that? Sorry. Um, and so this green infrastructure includes the bioswale. That's sort of the easy cookie cutter solution that DEP can do, that the city can do. Um, but it also includes um, private property. Um, so through a grant program, as well as public property like schoolyards um, and NYCHA campuses. However, <laughs> in New York City, since 2011, only 30 green infrastructure projects have been built under the private grant program. Since 2009, only 10 people have taken the tax abatement for green roof construction. This is because actually in order to use these tools, um, there are numerous hoops to, uh, to run through. Um, because of the regulations, but there also just isn't a clear understanding of how these things can be helpful. Um, a sort of more dire statistic from the Gowanus is by 2020, we were supposed to have 166 acres of green infrastructure. We have 13. And even if we were to get all that green infrastructure, we, were, we would still have 115 million gallons of CSO every year overflow into the Gowanus Canal because it's only getting us down to what the regulatory body requires, not actually getting us to zero. However, there's a lot of stuff that everyday people can do to actually help be part of the solution, um, from conserving water to actually building their own green infrastructure. It doesn't need to be expensive. It can be you know, a, a rain barrel or, um, or a green roof, uh, but there's, I mean, there's, there's so many different ways in which people can take action that isn't, that aren't being addressed and aren't being promoted. Um, we have seen that in Gowanus, we actually could get to zero through better implementation of some of these practices. So in order to do that, I think we really need to talk about it. I think we need to use, I, I think we need to tie green infrastructure to the raw sewage that is going into our water bodies in a much more visceral um, and, and tangible way and get every citizen, it should be required civic education. So the ways in which I think are most critical to do it are making it visible, making it gross, breaking down the silos between people who care about sewage and people who care about all the other things that we care about and making it mandatory knowledge for civic education. So I think a great example of making it visible is the um, Newtown wastewater treatment plant um, built by DEP that really, you know, this is a great uh, Valentine's Day uh, tour actually. And it's, it, it's beautiful and it's wild and crazy and it feels like infrastructure, but it, it also feels like, a, like city making at the same time. Um, another great thing the DEP has done is they've done an incredibly sexy campaign about something called fatbergs, um, which is, and I just, this is, you know, the, the web page of the fatberg page versus the web page of the green infrastructure page. The fatberg page has a video of how disposable or flush, flushable wipes and oil congeal into massive fatbergs in our pipe system. 
the green infrastructure page has a sort of hard to read map of green infrastructure projects that says green infrastructure prevents stormwater from entering the city's sewer system, which helps to improve the health of local waterways. It does not mention sewage at all. We have these Fatberg advertisements all around town in like extraordinarily visible places. And they say exactly why you should not flush wipes. DEP has finally um, released a new signage for the bioswales which is a, you know, a lovely drawing of how a bioswale works, but again, says absolutely nothing about its impact on local water bodies. And we need to use this, this gross, this visceral, this, when you see poop in the water, you wanna change it, right? When you see a bioswale on the street that has trash in it, you're like, why did someone put a garden there? Let's connect those two. Breaking down silos, I think this is in Gowanus right now, as folks probably know, we're going through a massive rezoning um, and there are so many issues on the table. Um, through organizing that we're doing with the Gowanus Neighborhood Coalition for Justice, we're not, we're specifically trying to break down those silos within the neighborhood that the city would like to put us in um, and advocate for each other's issues. Um, our number one demand is fund NYCHA, fund public housing, fix the lead, fix the mold. And then our number two demand is net zero CSO. These are extraordinarily different processes, but they both need to be done in order to make the neighborhood whole. Um, and so this is you know, us with our CSO Punami hats on at the Halloween parade last year, really like getting folks to who li literally don't have heat or hot water in their apartments to actually to really care about these larger the, the environmental issues as well. Um, and then finally, making it mandatory knowledge. Every student should learn about the infrastructure that our city is based on. Um, they should understand how this infrastructure fits together. Um, and with those tools, they actually will they, they will have the tools to change it. And I want to um, do I have enough time for like do I have one more minute? Two more minutes, great. Okay, I am going to, man, Erica, I'm also having trouble finding all my things today. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this and I am going to share a very short video um, to show what I mean. CSO is bad. <laughs> Basically, CSO is combined sewage overflow, like one of the main causes of like pollution in our water, such as the Golanus. And our goal is to keep the New York City water clean and prevent it from becoming more dirty than it already is. So green infrastructure is like ideas that can be man-made, like permeable pavement, and permeable means like allows water to pass through so it can absorb water. So we want to make it a little more resilient. Uh, so we're trying to like figure out how we can make like clean up the Gowanus and how we can have like more green space in schools. So we're like adding different like tree beds and trying to add like stuff on the roofs to try to collect as much rainwater as possible so it doesn't overflow into the Gowanus. Um, so the video goes on. Um, and you're welcome to see it, it's on our website. But um, my point being, these middle schoolers can describe combined sewage overflow and can talk about the solutions to it. They go home, they talk to their parents. These are the sorts of large scale social changes. You know, remember when we all learned about recycling? It's the same kind of thing. We can do this with poop, we can do this with critical infrastructure. Um, and we just need to, we need to have a multi-pond strategy. So it's not, again, it's not about saying, this shouldn't be regulation. It's about saying that we need to prioritize education and organizing just as much as regulation. And that's all, thanks. Thank you, awesome.
Elizabeth Hanoff is a computational biologist with an art practice and an assistant professor in technology, culture, and society department at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Elizabeth, it's all yours. Thank you, Taisa. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Do y'all see a white text on a black background? Yep. Yep. Cool. Cool. Um, hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be part of this panel and uh, and thinking about um, ecology at a bunch of different scales. And so as Taisa said at the beginning, um, I'm gonna be talking about the, the, the lower end, the microscopic end of the scale. And so in particular, what I'd like to talk about today is briefly uh, some projects that show microbial agents at the interstices of everyday urban ecologies. And so um, I'm, I'm a computational biologist, and in particular, I'm interested in the um, ubiquitous living component of our environments. So specifically, the microorganisms that inhabit the environments um, that's, that, we, that we interact with. Um, and so there's this growing understanding that interactions with microorganisms have really important impacts on the characteristics or phenotypes of macroscopic organisms, like plants, like animals, um, like humans. So for example, you can alter the flowering time of plants by altering the microbial composition of the soil that they're growing in. Um, we're also getting more familiar with the idea of the human microbiome being an important component for health and well-being, um, both in you know, grave states of disease, but also more subtle phenotypes um, like, uh, like mental health. And so, uh, serotonin synthesis, for example, in, uh, in, in, in humans is, uh, is heavily influenced by, uh, by our interaction with gut microbiome, microbes in particular. And so this is just a couple of examples of how kind of the phenotype or visual or physical characteristic of a macroscopic multicellular organism like ourselves are due not only to our own genotype, so not only to our own genes, uh, but also to the genes of the microorganisms with which we interact. And so kind of the zombie idea that I would like to kill today is uh, of thinking of, of humans as individuals that exist in a void and um, kind of proposing an alternate uh, definition of the notion of the individual that encompasses both host and symbiont. Um, there's a word that's been coined for that and that has been in use for a, for a while, but it takes a particular um, a meaning in the context of genetics, which is holobiont. So um, holobiont is a term that encompasses the notion of both host and symbiont. And so what I'm interested in um, and what I study and research at NYU is being able to define kind of microbial metrics of urban spaces. So how, how do we measure the invisible microbial component of our environments? Um, and then how could those metrics inform uh, principles of design? And so I wanted to talk about a couple of projects um, where I found kind of interesting microbial agents in the interstices of urban spaces. And, uh, and actually both of these projects are in Gowanus and in collaboration with, the, with Andrea and the GCC. So I'm really glad Andrea that you, uh, that you started talking about food before I did because I'm gonna continue. <laughs> Um, so one ongoing project in, in the lab um, is studying the microorganisms that uh, live in the sediment of the Gowanus Canal. So, you know, Andrea, you talked about the poop in the canal, but that's not the only gross thing in the canal. Um, you know, the canal is, has been heavily contaminated with industrial waste over the last uh, 150, 200 years. Um, and the sediment at the bottom of the canal is this kind of toxic uh, cocktail of a, of a bunch of different um, industrial waste compounds. And so we've been studying the microorganisms that are able to survive in, um, in that toxic wasteland. And it turns out that uh, that toxic wasteland is actually a very amenable environment for microbial growth. And that those microbes in the process of adapting to that environment have developed a lot of interesting bioremediation functions. 
So they're able to degrade the toxic compounds uh, that they're being challenged with. And so I think this is, um, this is really interesting from a science perspective, you know, thinking about evolution of organisms and their environments. Um, but also it's, I think it's, it's really poetic in a certain sense, because what that means is that, um, is that the kind of living present day microbiome of the canal maintains uh, a record or a, a, you know, a molecular echo of the history of human intervention at that site. Um, what this also does is challenge the valence that we give to environments um, such as the Guanas Canal. So the Guanas Canal, it's a super fun site. Um, there's plans to remediate it, with, which involve, you know, dredging all the sediment and capping the rest with concrete and putting the water back. Um, and so that particular the intervention in that site is dictated by the kind of human-centered perspective that this environment is useless. It's a wasteland. Uh, but if we kind of decenter the human in this process and look at it from a microbial perspective, we can see that this environment is actually not as unenvironmental as you might think and is very much amenable um, to these other life forms. Uh, so this is an ongoing project with a bunch of different folks. We have a website called bkbioreactor.com and you guys can check out all of the, the data that we've posted there. Um, the other project that I wanted to talk about is a project also in the Gowanus Canal uh, relating, uh, related to, to urban to street level flooding. Um, and so street level flooding uh, in this particular area occurs when um, heavy rainfall will overwhelm the sewer system, which as Andrea mentioned is a combined sewage system. And uh, this particular flooding that we see here is not the canal overflowing its banks, um, but it's water that is resurging from the street drains and flooding and flooding the street. And so, um, and so this water has a lot of poop in it. It has raw sewage in it. And um, and so what we've been uh, what we've been doing is trying to see whether we can uh, whether we can understand what kind of impacts these flooding events have on the environmental microbiomes, so and in particular, the sidewalks after floodwaters have receded. So we've been running a pilot study in, um, in Gowanus on 9th Street, which is where the, the image that we, that we looked at earlier, where we take samples of the sidewalk in areas that are frequently flooded and then control areas that are not frequently flooded and look at the microbial populations and how they differ between them. And so we can see that the flooded uh, sidewalk areas that are flooded frequently um, have a different microbial signature than sidewalk areas that are, that are not flooded. Um, and so just to be clear here, this is, these are not sam samples taken after a recent flood. These are samples taken after uh, kind of in, in normal conditions. Um, so this is an example of how um, kind of a combination of both planetary and climactic factors, um, as well as infrastructure and economic factors are dictating uh, the populations of microorganisms that we, you know, as residents of New York City interact with on a daily basis in, uh, in our built environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are just a couple of, uh, of projects I'm, I'm glad to discuss. <laughs> more if anybody is interested in, in others, but I would like to bring up kind of a couple of, uh, a couple of thoughts that I've, been, um, that, I've, that I've been kind of evolving in this process of trying to study something invisible. And so there's like, you know, there's a couple of the previous speakers who have spoken to visualizing the invisible as an important, um, as a, an important tool and process to be able to inform design. And so, you know, when we're studying the invisible, uh, our experiences with this invisible component are always mediated by objects, by instruments. So, you know, we use a microscope to look at microbes. Um, the, you know, the, the object that mediates, uh, that is, you know, most common in my research practice is that of the swab. So, <laughs> Previously, when I've shown pictures of swabs, people are kind of like, what is this? And I have to explain that it's like, 
you know, it's kind of like a glorified Q-tip and you like scrub it to collect a sample. <laughs> now we've all been, you know, all too familiar with these swabs and have one stuck uncomfortably up into our brain. <laughs> but, um, but anyways, this is the object that kind of uh, most commonly mediates the relationship that we have with this invisible living component of our environment. And so, so this relationship is more so with this instrument than the actual living organisms. Um, and there's, there's some things to be, to be understood and kind of clarified about how this object can bias that relationship. So on one side, uh, that bias is one of scale. So the swab, you know, is like half an inch big. Um, and then if you, you know, if you're trying to use that instrument to study something at a city scale, there's a, there's a disparity of scale here in resolution uh, that spans, that spans orders of magnitude. And so one of the kind of um, areas of research that I've been exploring is how can we scale our instruments to a better resolution to, um, to fit the resolution of, of what we're studying. So um, we've been working on some projects using uh, honeybees actually as sampling devices um, because honeybees will you know, leave their hive, forage for a few miles radius and then come back to their hive and we're actually able to recover microbial information um, from the debris that accumulates at the bottom of the hive and understand the microbial environments that these honeybees have been traversing. Um, Another thing that has kind of emerged from these studies is that, um, is that the design of this instrument very much dictates the relationship. So uh, a few years ago, we did a study where we studied uh, the microbiome of the New York subway. So we, you know, ran around the subway with these swabs in hand, you know, taking samples from, uh, from poles and seats. And, um, and we were challenged oftentimes by people who were reacting to that instrument. So they thought that we were implanting HIV in the subway um, or that we were monitoring for a pandemic. I mean, that was like 2015, so pre-pandemic times. Um, but that relationship was very much to the instrument and had, is a relationship of kind of fear and pathogenicity, which makes sense because this is a clinical instrument. Um, hey, Elizabeth, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna build on that now and we're gonna sure. go to Q and A. That sounds great. Thanks, Stacey. And, and actually, Leah, um, everyone take a good close look at that image because it's going to be a perfect segue. But if you want to unshare your screen, sure. that's actually a great segue. Um, so I, I want to now turn to getting all of you in conversation and also um, remind others that if they want to write questions, just write them in the chat. If you can write succinct questions, that would be great because I'm monitoring both the chat and the people. But I wonder. Um, all of you talked about language and actually Elizabeth, you ending with this idea of the tool matters, um, not just what the tool can do, but how we perceive the tool. Um, and um, Kate, you talked about language as a tool, sort of taking these standards and design and, and shaping them in a, in a different way. And Erica, you also about talking and, and Andrea certainly talking about poop and gross things. So I'm wondering if all of you could talk about the role of language and how it shapes the physical manifestation then of what we do, whether it's an experiment or it's a place you're creating. And because I think it's something designers don't often talk enough about the power of words and tools like words and language to actually change what we make. Andrea, you're smiling, you wanna go first? Um, sure. I let me formulate this. <laughs> um, I think I'm smiling because um, I find that, and uh, students that are in my current class um, will know that it's it's always it's always shocking how difficult it is to emphasize writing as part of a design project, um, and I think that it's actually the skill that I use most. And obviously I'm not a practicing landscape architect, but when I was a practicing landscape architect, you use language constantly. It is actually like more critical to be able to give a succinct one sentence concept, what you're doing, than it is to make 
50 billion beautiful renderings. Because that's what, I mean, people aren't, I, the everyday person, yes, they'll see a beautiful drawing, but they won't actually, they look for the language, they look for the way to say it. Um, so I guess I don't, I guess that's where I would stop. Well, no, that's, that's great. Kate, as, as somebody who also showed incredibly um, vibrant images, do you want to talk again about language and maybe visual language and verbal word language? Yeah. I mean, a lot of, I mean, uh, my, my own focus in language is to try, was to, 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 to try to like D, you know, sometimes we try to define ourselves as a discipline via this sort of special code words or language that we use to describe each other or particular movement. And I think a lot of at least what I've tried to do is to sort of just ignore that <laughs> and try to write in very clear and declarative tone about, um, you know, what what's happening in the world as I see it. And and so the, the Petrochemical America book was very thick drawings that take a lot of time to understand, but I tried to combine that with very clear declarative writing in, in tone um, to just um, to be a companion to that. So I, I do feel also sometimes language, uh, for better, for worse, we're trying to use it to distinguish ourselves or define ourselves as a certain kind of landscape architect when it serves to kind of turn people off and, and obfuscate, you know, really what are just like the basic kind of challenges that we're facing. So that's, that's my take on it. Yeah. E Erica? Yeah, I, it's a wonderful question. Um, it reminds me, I wrote a, a book chapter many years ago now for a book edited by Stuart Pickett. Um, and the title was um, about storyline shaping design. And I'm not a designer, I'm a social scientist. And, but it was drawn from some observations and some research that I did a long time ago for my dissertation, you know, looking at the power of story, words, social facts that really are you know, exist in everyday life and they kind of exist outside of ourselves as individuals, but they, they shape us. And I was looking at the South Bronx Greenway and the phrase there is greening the ghetto. And I was looking at the High Line and the phrase there might be building upon ruins. And then I was looking at the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway and the phrase there might be opening up the waterfront. And these words have tremendous meaning and they influence, I think in many ways, if not the design, the, you know, who kind of coalesces and comes, you know, comes to the table around the ideas. Um, and, and they're very powerful. They were powerful in Baltimore. And that's why I raised, uh, you know, the David Simon's work on the corner and the wire and life on the streets, which was, is not untrue, but really kind of focuses you on a very specific set of social facts about a place. Yeah. And it, it's, it's hard work to hard work to to counter those facts when they're out there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, because you you inspired this question in talking about the, the importance of the tool um, really as dictating the nature of the relationship, right? But but I'm also wondering if how thinking about the tool and that relationship might also shape how you go how you go about thinking about your experiments and, and what kinds of questions you pursue. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we like to think of instruments as being impartial kind of extensions of our sensory system, uh, but, that's, but that's really not the case. Like these instruments kind of manifest the preconceived ideas that we have about the thing that we're studying and have been designed in that, in that particular direction. Um, and so, so I think that, uh, I think the instruments are definitely not impartial. Um, Karen Barad, who's a physicist and feminist theorist, says that uh, an, the instrument is itself a phenomenon and that it's, um, you know, it is also, it is also an action um, that defines that. And so I think with respect to thinking about that also as with language as a tool, I think that particularly in the biological sciences, the act of naming is very powerful. Like for example, you were saying, Erica, that you know, giving names to these projects kinds of de kind of defines them. Uh, but in the in the biological sciences, I think the act of naming um, is a, is has has been a very um, colonial practice 
of you know naming plants and organisms that already had names, or like Western scientists naming plants and organisms that already had names, um, and then you know bringing them back. And uh, and so I think just as just as naming is is um, is a very powerful tool, um, also I think um, creating an instrument is a way of kind of of naming a phenomenon, or designing an instrument is a way of naming a phenomenon. I mean, one one other example I think is. Well, the Scape's work with GC Gowanus Canal Conservancy, the, the plan is called the Lowlands. It's not like master vision for the revitalization of, you know, it's like boom. <laughs> it, it, you know, <laughs> and it too and and so it's like we're sort of trying to advance, I don't want to say a reality, but advance this sort of physical reality of the place alongside just an acknowledgement of, of that. I thought you know that has a little bit of a story and a name wrapped up in it i can put that link in the chat too later yeah yeah well i'm curious to to build on that so in in that case one one might if one didn't know better one might argue okay so you're giving it a title that gives it a public a public face something the public can get behind and but i also know that these titles shape how we actually make what we make Right and 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 the questions we ask and and what we privilege and um, so I'm wondering if you could talk either or sort of how how are you shaping through language what the public expects but also how are you shaping what you actually do and what you make and the place that that some of you are creating or the arguments that you're creating I'm I'm going to put place and argument in sort of one box because I think they're all things that we make. I mean, I think to, to Kate's point about the Gowanus Lowlands, that's specifically about allowing flooding, like acknowledging the lowness of this place. Um, and through that, making design decisions about how water can move. Erica, as you go back and you think about this project, I mean, again, the to me, what I heard in your argument was in part not that there weren't good qualities that came out of an, a sort of technocratic view of that project, but that they didn't understand the depth to which you could actually look at that project. And I'm wondering if in thinking back on that project, you're doing work differently now. And what does that look like to, to talk about it differently and then make differently? Well, I think in some ways I'm returning uh, back to that project. I guess maybe the older I get and things and maybe a little bit more stubborn and, um, but you know, the end result of that work uh, many years ago gave rise to um, ZooMap, to the work that I've done with Lindsay Campbell and others to kind of map um, many, many, many places of social meaning. And ZooMap is a, is a representation of, of groups, not individuals. But, you know, in that way, um, I was trying to do two things, create a tool right, give it a name, right, because I work for the Forest Service and I even gave it an acronym, right, that's, enough, that's the thing you have to do in, in government agencies. Um, and I was like, you know, in some ways we were, we were playing along, but at the other end of things, we were really trying to be empathetic and sympathetic to decision makers and natural resource planners, park managers that we work with to say, um, we can tell you these stories and we can beat you over the head that you must pay attention to social meaning and community, but here's a tool, here's something that you can start with and some data because they need that, right? You need that at the end of the day to make your case. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where that work kind of evolved, but just wanted to raise something else because for me, um, when I look back at those times and the reason why I say the forest within, it's something that Kate was saying, like love the landscape. I really do feel like at the end of the day, it's the love that is abiding in the sustainable city. Now I know that's gonna sound corny, right? Oh, love, love, but okay, fear is a great motivator. We're all scared of climate change. Guilt, great motivator. We all did it, so we feel bad about ourselves. And profit, you know, maybe we can make a little money here, come up with a little widget, you know, uh, energy savings all great reasons and great motivations, but it's the love that sustains. It's the love that lasts. It's the love that you know, people put in the extra. 
you know, miles to do these things and, and to care for them. Actually, it, you bring up a really interesting question. So we often think, um, so there's some who think that we need a crisis. One of the interesting um, arguments I heard today from a climate scientist that it was really dangerous that the uh, media so quickly compared our COVID-19 epidemic to the 1917-20 flu because in fact that flu killed between 25 and 50 million people. This is a terrible pandemic. People are suffering, but it's not lethal in the way and that we sort of over blew some analogies and, and some comparisons that might have put. So this idea of having a crisis to name and then at the other end of the spectrum, I think we often try to think of as particularly in landscape architecture, but more generally in design about the positive that we're going to do. And I'm wondering if any of you want to talk about how do you balance sort of naming the crisis hmm. and finding the love. So naming the climate crisis or the social inequity crisis or the poop crisis, but then also being able to name the love and the caring and the positive piece that we're moving towards that we might not necessarily know exactly how, or I don't think we know how. Kate, I'm particularly interested, like in your work, you know, you talk about changing those names, naming what you don't like, naming something else. How does that work? And, and again, how does that, can you see that in the designs, the places that you've designed when you go there? Do you feel like you could experience that change? Yeah, I mean, I, I do feel like there's, um, I guess we, or I, we fall in the same rhetorical traps of trying to use a crisis as a springboard for action because most of the time, like, really, it's hard to get, um, you would say, resources focused or attention focused otherwise on, on, on certain things. So, you know, I'm sure, you know, the donations to the Gowanus Canal Conservancy go up when there's like poop in people's basements, right? Like there's some, there is some relationship to those, those aspects. I mean, I guess, I guess where I would like to go is, is just, you know, I, I, I keep going back to this notion of just gardening and somehow that landscape architecture has gotten so far away from gardening and like because gardening has been reframed as some kind of elitist act or but the reality is it's just really hard work and and you have to know a lot of things you have to like stay with things over years and over seasons to say oh I'm gonna save that tomato plant cutting and like and it's all about being like incredibly an economy of means and like you know investing in in a place over time and and obviously you know big history and may, maybe that's kind of like overly simplifying things but to, to me I also just feel like isn't couldn't we draw more from from those kinds of metaphors in in how we're practicing and um you know, like, like many kind of uh, practicing landscape architects, I just personally experienced like a, an, ex, you know, a frustration because your term of in a project seems like a really long time, but then all of a sudden it's, it's over, right? And you're kind of like moved on and the client's moved on and you kind of lose that direct relationship. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm always kind of like searching for that, whatever tool or whatever mode of working it is that could kind of kind of build a lot of that continuity back into to what it is that we do. So yeah. I mean that sort of harkens back to the CDCA yeah. done kind of, kind of zombie idea. Yeah. Um, so I think that issue of time is 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 definitely something to 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 build in. And yeah, and ideally you 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 know you can see that in the plazas that we've built and the sort of landscapes that are in, in formation. Elizabeth, in your work, could you, you, you describe a pretty gross reality. Uh, uh, there's a crisis here with this well. I'm assuming the sidewalk microbiome after those floods is not something we all really want to know about um, or we, you know, would find pleasant. What would it be like to, to be able to describe what you're working towards if you want to flip it and take Erica or Kate's idea of, of sort of love and stewardship and gardening how, would that alter? How would that might that shape your work? Yeah, I think the idea, the notion of stewardship with respect to microorganisms is um, is maybe a really contentious one, or has been maybe even more so now. Um, 
I think most of and why? Us, why, that, is, why is stewardship contentious in? Well, I mean, I guess in the in the context of a global pandemic, thinking about cohabitating willingly with living biological component of our environment is is really hard. Um, but I think even in general. Um, our relationship with microbes has first been a relationship with pathogens, like the first kind of explicit relationships that we've had with microbes are, are with pathogens because the first microbes to be characterized were pathogens. And, um, and that, that kind of relationship has, has persisted. And so I think most of the explicit interactions that we have with microbes is with their elimination. So, you know, using disinfecting products in our home, um, in our choice of materials, for example, so you know you can buy anti um, antimicrobial paint for your home, um, and so so I think that um, thinking of about stewardship with respect to microbes feels um, feels really hard because they're hard to relate to. They're not like warm and fuzzy like other kinds of <laughs> other kinds of animals that we might want to steward. Um, but I think that uh, that it's a really necessary practice to understand that um, kind of our health and, and well-being are dependent on these multi-species relationships, and um, and that and that that process of stewardship might make us feel uncomfortable in that process of adaptation. But I think that that's why we need good tools to be able to do it. So maybe we need tools that don't feel as clinical as the swab to be able to interact with, with microbes and that would help us feel more like stewards than, uh, um, than enemies. <laughs> yeah. Andrea, I'm, I'm thinking of, of your sort of, if we talked about poop more clear, you know, more openly and, and with enthusiasm, if we stewarded our engagement with poop, where would that take us? And could you think about where it might go beyond even just maybe we would, you know, have better sewer systems or, or sort of immediate? Are there th other ways that an engagement with topics like that might help us to reimagine our environment or our relationship to the environment? Um, I mean, I definitely think that we could become more comfortable with our bodies if we talked more openly about poop. <laughs> um, um, there was actually, I don't know if folks saw, there was a great article about um, about incontinence after childbirth um, in the Times yesterday, I think, um, and how we don't talk about that, even though it's something that happens to like 30% of women. Um, I think that this, I mean, and I think that is, you know, underneath this idea of the sanitary city is this idea of ourselves being sanitary, ourselves being not having microbes on us, being clean, being basically machines, and this idea of a messier world in which we might get poop on our feet and you know our our cities might flood <laughs> um, we might get hit by hurricanes our entire economy and civilization might fall apart however we're still here and we're still we still have these human bonds and this love as Eric is saying I feel like that's the I feel like that's the big paradigm shift that we need to have is actually like not fearing the crisis so much as embracing it and accepting it and adapting to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it. It reminds me vaguely of the um, discussion of, of natural disasters and whether in fact we should, if they're natural occurrences, are they disasters or right? And, and uh, mm -hmm. landscape architects have claimed, right? We should be friends with floods. So that idea of crisis, right? and and rethinking crisis as part of mm -hmm. cycles that we live in. There's an interesting, quite, there's some great comments actually about kombucha and sourdough and microbiome. So maybe we're all on the tipping edge of rethinking our microbiomes, which um, is interesting itself. But there's a, a question here about the transformation, perhaps the transformation emerges from the embracement of nonlinear progression in the phases of landscape engagements, the question, oops, this is why I hate this, because it moves on me, sorry. The question, uh, the shift to rhythm rather than to acts. So I think this is asking about 
is some of this shift to move away from the singular act, the singular object, the thing, um, which certainly came up last week, this sort of focus we have on the things and the fixes and more think in terms of rhythms and um, cycles and systems. And, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this person's question. So if, if I trashed your question, rewrite it. But, but I think it's an interesting question of, is part of this a shift to, to rhythms and I think of it as systems or, or compositions rather than pieces. And, I mean, I think that goes to Kate's point about gardening as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there's a there's an assumption in our in the field of landscape architecture as well as design professions that you always need to be doing something new, right? That like any if you're going to renovate a park, you need to have a completely new concept. You need to rip everything out. You need to start from scratch. Um, instead of thinking, oh wow, wouldn't it be wonderful if everything was maintained on a regular basis and cultivated over time and there was care and things changed slowly. Um, and I feel like that's like, I think we would need to completely reimagine our fee structures <laughs> um, to get to where Kate's talking about. But I, I mean, I think if, if the profession as a whole decided that that was where to push it, I feel like it's something that we could collaborate on together. Mm -hmm. Others want to chime in, Erica? Um, sure. Well, I just there's a lot, there's a lot to reflect on in that uh, bit of conversation, but I do want to appreciate this idea of crisis and say that um, because a lot of uh, the work that I've been interested in over the years is about post disturbance, post crisis, both acute and chronic, and how stewardship plays a role. Uh, in, in kind of recovery from crisis, but it never ends. It's kind of like the gardening. It's kind of like when, when the crisis strikes, it's go time. And then, then you know whether, you know, the gardening you did last year, or the care and feeding that you've done really is gonna pay off. Um, but this, this notion that um, we can fix things and, and move on or that we can control things and move on. You know, it's it's an old concept, right? And it just that's a, that's a something that just won't die, you know. And and going back to you know the idea of being comfortable with uncertainty, understanding change, being you know the whole idea about stewardship is to attend to something over time, right? Um, and 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 it must make a landscape architect's job very difficult. I have mad respect because you know. You're there, you have to solve a lot of problems in one fell swoop. And then yes, does it stay the same always? No, of course not. You know, it's all, it, it's we're all never the same river trice. Um, but uh, same thing with, with social science, you know, you, you go back to these, you have these issues and you go back and you say, gosh, that sounds familiar. I remember something writing, somebody writing about that 30 years ago, but they just use different words, say the same thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So another person asked the question, uh, Erica and Kate, but I think this is really for everyone because um, you all presented visual materials with your talks. So how do visual arts help us to see the unseen, to, to help see the invisible? Um, and, and I'm thinking as much Elizabeth about scientific drawing and mic microscope photographs, right, that, that have helped us see to landscape architecture drawings to the photographic collaborations that people have done. Um, similar to our discussion about language and words, how do the visual arts help? And in particular, I want to ask, how do they help us challenge or kill these zombies, as, as Denise says? How do they help us actually do the good fight. Elizabeth, do you want to start with it? I, I think in science, it's sort of seeing the unseen, right? That's always the, the challenge is that for most of us, we have no idea what you're talking about, you know, what you. Yeah, I think, I think it's, um, it really is a challenge in the field of microbiology of, um, of scale of representation. And, and I feel that my, my understanding of this invisible world has, 
has been built over over a long time with many different understandings in different ways. And so I, I feel like I have kind of this like three dimensional model in my head of how, you know, cells work and interact and, you know, plants and microbes. And, um, but that, that, um, that image um, maybe can only exist in my imagination and that any attempt to try to communicate it is always, is always a flattening. Um, and so, and so I think that, uh, I think that the medium of visual communication is really important for us to be able to kind of transfer imaginations. Um, I think that, the, that it really is a, a challenge in the field of microbiome analyses to try to visually represent this data in a meaningful way because the scales exist at such different orders of magnitude. So even thinking about making a map, you know, you could think about making like a heat map of New York City with prevalence of different microbes, but um, but that map is always going to be misrepresenting in, in some kind of way because because the sample that we took was you know over a few square inches, and then the map that we're looking at is at is at, at the scale of New York City. Um, I think that there's um, I've seen visual representations that I feel to be detrimental to the imagination and the, and the field, which are maybe like very literal representations of, you know, little blobs floating around people or something um, that seem to enforce kind of this, um, this idea of, of, uh, of contagion or uncleanliness. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's an area that's really ripe for, um, for creativity at the moment. I, I like your bringing up of also where visual can, can um, do damage or where, where, it, where it can undermine um, the work. And I wonder if anybody else wants to talk about where, where images might, might do the wrong or might not be helpful. Uh, no, more than not just be helpful, but might actually help send the wrong message. Well, I think right now there's a little bit of a backlash to the, without like design culture, or I don't know how to put it, but it's like yeah. where there are just architectural publications that simply print like press releases from firms, download the images and, um, so I mean I guess everybody. So what I, I would just say on on the on the, the practi practitioner side of that, it's like that is the kind of image that your client is asking you to make. But I you know I think what we've at least tried to do is um, find layers or way of splicing in the existing conditions. And I think the ones that do harm are ones that kind of show wholesale new conditions and don't necessarily acknowledge the background complexity or like whatever is creating that, you know, ghost in the machine. <laughs> it's like, that's the image, that's part of it. So I, I do feel like we, we err in terms of trying to make a per perfect rendering and don't, aren't conscious of that feeling of erasure that other people feel. Like, I'll just speak from the, the Gowana standpoint, it was so hard to, to try to describe how much that we were trying to carry forward on that project of existing conditions, but also you know, create a three-dimensional view of something that might also spark an imagination. So I don't know, I find that to be one of the hardest things to do and to think about. Andrea, you were, you were nodding your head, you wanna add? So many things. <laughs> I was not in it. Quite a few things. Um, I mean, for for one, I think the just on the last one about Gowanus, I feel like the one of the most difficult things to really communicate about any of this is time. Is mm -hmm. like the amount of phase change that's happening right now. You know, a lot of the changes that, that like you can have. I guess it's, and I mean, Gowanus is a, is a very chaotic environment because there are so many different, uh, you know, owners and so many different processes at once. But I think being able to like fully understand what a finished product looks like 
because you do need to have some sort of finished product when you have to do DD, SD, CDs, um, when there will never be a finished product. product. And I think, I mean, at first I was nodding because I was thinking about um, planting plans and planting renderings in particular, um, which are so, I, I think so disruptive to the client's expectation for what a landscape will look like. Um, we constantly use enormous canopy trees when really that's not going to happen for another 50 years. Um, and I think that, and I think that, again, I think in landscape architecture, I think we're constantly like backing each other into corners by, you know, making sexier and sexier renderings um, that show stuff that's just not possible. Yeah, or, or, or at least not without time. So the two combined, and, and I do think, and it's interesting because I think we tend to think that images are somehow neutral at worst, and, and we don't always acknowledge the, the damage and the, the, the bad consequences uh, that you, the wrong kind of images. Erica, do you want to add yeah, something just, there? Yeah, I just really, uh, just using kind of the artist as a critical reflection of the work. I mean, if I could have an artist work on every project I've ever been on, that would be amazing. Um, I was fortunate to have uh, Steffi Graham with us so many years ago on that project in Baltimore. And what she did for us as community organizers, essentially, that's what we were, um, was share back to us critically um, things about ourself, um, the components of the project, the messy components of the project, not the beauty shots, you know, of the landscape trees or this or that or the beautiful flowers. Uh, but most importantly, she honed in, and we weren't even on this point in the beginning, she really honed in hard on the transformation in people. And she really tried to capture that moment when people were really connecting with, with any number of things, each other, a plant, this, that, the other thing. And, and and in good and bad ways, you know, in the in the you know, so so there were moments where people were, you know, I showed a shot of of uh, one of the summer camp workers who was fearful because she had a bunch of kids out there in a community, and uh, there was active drug dealing happening right there, and they were nervous, and they were they were hearing things, and you know, Steffi was able to just capture that in the moment, and we were it was so chaotic we weren't even paying attention to any of that, you know, but but looking back at these images. It gave, it gave the work a little bit more meaning for us. And then we dug in harder and did more because of it. Yeah, excellent. We are just about out of time. So I just wanna ask quickly, is, is there anything in listening to each other's that any of you would wanna comment on or think about or... I have to say, Andrea, I just love the fact that, you know, you are putting at the forefront uh, NYCHA as part of some of your advocacy. I just wanted to say that um, because, I mean, just take a pause at environmental organization, you know, doing that kind of reciprocity, not just saying, come join us, learn about the Gowanus, clean it up, it's a great place, but really attending to the needs uh, in that way is, is really profound and should happen more. Well, I just want to thank all of you because I, I do think, as, as I said at the beginning, this is a moment we really need to challenge boldly. It is clear what we've been doing has not led us to a place that we want to be. And so I really want to applaud those who are out rethinking um, everything from how we talk about what we're doing to what we actually do and what we imagine in the future, um, because we clearly can't continue on the path that we're on. So with that lovely uplifting note, I'll turn it over to Denise to put us in a better space. Well, I don't think I can put us in a better space than this panel has left us. Um, and I just wanna say that Erica's last comment really, you know, in some ways summarized the whole ambition of the project was how do we start to look at um, environmental systems and social systems as something that we have to operate in you know, negotiate together intrinsically. They cannot be disconnected. And, and I think this panel really covered that really great. And I'm looking forward to next week when I hope the panel covers it well, because I'll be presenting 
And Tim Malley will be the moderator next week. So I do want to just thank Thaisa once again for doing double duty to open this conference and to thank the presenters and everybody who contributed to chat and just sat here and enjoyed the presentations. Thank you for joining us and good night.